All right, how do I advance? Here we go. Let's see. You got it? That advancing. That did yeah. that advance up there? All right. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, it is such a pleasure to see so many familiar faces here. Um, I'm sure most of you in this room are probably tired of listening to me like yap because you've been with me all week. But if you don't know me, I'm Dusty McKenzie. I teach uh, I teach archaeology at Cabrillo College. And I just want to thank the society for having me here tonight. I know uh, there's this great person that was originally scheduled. Her name's Anna Marie Leon Guerrero that is going to be speaking with us tonight. And I'm sad and you're sad that she's not here because she's way better at this stuff than I am. So bear with me. And I'm, tr I'm going to try not to bore you tonight. And I'm going to try not to say anything too stupid. So if I do, just please raise your hands. We're such an intimate group tonight. If you have any questions about clarification, about anything I say, raise your hands because I can stop. It's not that formal. So, so anyway, so thanks for being here. Um, let's see. So um, my background, when I'm not teaching at Cabrillo College, my background, I've always been really, I've, I've, I'm a lifetime fisherman. As many of you know, I still fish a lot in the summer, uh, more than my wife would want me to. Um, and I'm really interested archaeologically in maritime and littoral adaptations in archaeology. So I'm a part of a, a big group of nerds that studies the relationship between humans and, and the ocean and other large bodies of, of water. And you might be thinking, um, why? That kind of sounds kind of silly. But it's it's awesome, right? It's absolutely flipping awesome. And one of the reasons that we study the relationships between humans and the ocean is because we have a long history as a species. And even prior to Homo sapiens evolving, um, some of our earliest hominid ancestors might have evolved because they switched from terrestrial resources to maritime resources. And we've recently found that seafoods have all these long chain fatty acids in them that might be really important to neurological development and the expansion of our lar large brains um, through the evolutionary process. Um, fishing is also linked to cultural complexity. And we found archeologically that many groups that focus on fishing are as complex as some agricultural groups. If you're a fan of and interested in the colonization of the Americas by indigenous peoples, you might know that now we've kind of, we're thinking that the very first Americans, the first people to arrive here were already maritime adapted. And instead of, and you might remember this from high school, the idea that the first Americans were these megafauna hunters hunting mammoths and mastodons with sharp rocks on sticks. Um, we kind of moved beyond that. Now we're thinking that the very first people in the Americas were already fisher folk that were paddling down the coast, harvesting shellfish, catching, you know, catching fish, hunting sea mammals. Um, and maritime adaptations are extreme. The reason being is if you don't know this, humans are really poorly adapted for the life aquatic. I mean, hold up your hands. None of you, right? None of you have web fingers. None of you, right? If you do, talk to me, right? Well, you know, there, there might be some procedures. We can talk about that. None of us have gills. So in the ocean, if, if shit goes south, we have the tendency to die really, really easily, right? So one of the things that draws people to the study of these maritime adaptations is the, the rich technology that indigenous cultures developed um, to allow them to exploit the, the ocean effectively. And that includes boats, nets, harpoons, hooks, lures, traps, and this whole set of technology that allowed people to, to make a living from, from the ocean. So here's some of them, right? We have these harpoons, and these are from the Chumash territory, things that they might have used to harpoon large fish such as swordfish. Uh, boats, uh, the image on your upper right are trolling lures from Polynesia that were trolled behind canoes to catch fish like mahi-mahi. Um, we have, you know, abalone shellfish hooks right here in California. So it seems like people like me that study um, maritime cultures are, are drawn to these kind of sexy, shiny artifacts, which, which really brings me to, to the point where 
maybe it's this is reflected in the fact that I can spend six hours in Bass Pro Shop in the fishing section. And I know some of other you guys can too, right? You can spend six hours there just like looking at these these shiny lures, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my yeah. wife no longer lets me go to Bass Pro Shop alone. And she she euphemistically calls it uh, uh, Redneck Disneyland. So, yeah. so I'm just wondering if it's the same reason I'm attracted to, you know, uh, lures at Bass Pro is why I like like to do this, but um, unfortunately, we're not talking about any of that tonight. All that sexy stuff, migration, evolution, uh, big fish, swordfish—we're really not talking about any of anything about that this evening. And I and I really apologize. What we are talking about are these really ugly little tiny eel-like fish called pricklebacks. Um, if you are a local fisher person, you might know their larger cousin, the monkey face eel. Um, these are their smaller cousins, the rock and the black prickleback. And we're talking about fish. It's not an eel, it's a fish. And they generally only grow up to like this big. And most of them are much, much, much smaller. They, have a, they inhabit um, the rocky intertidal zone. When they're young, they eat largely uh, crustaceans. When they get bigger, like the ones we want to catch, they primarily eat algae. So they're like hippie vegans from Santa Cruz, right? <laughs> Eating kale and quinoa. Um, and But they're distributed from Southern Alaska all the way down to, to Northern, to Northern Baja. Um, and I started to see, you know, a pattern that I'll get to in a second. But before we get there, that's one of them in my hand, right? Um, showing you the size of a typical prickleback and adjacent to it is a typical and average size of a shell fish hook that was made and used by local indigenous folks. So hopefully you can see there's no way you're catching a prickleback on a hook, at least a shell hook. And that's also a photo of the types of environments they inhabit, a high energy surf line in a really rocky reef. So they're also, even though it's a small fish, there's no way you can employ nets in these areas. So it led me to believe that the only way these things are being captured is by people going down to the intertidal zone on low tide and picking them up by, by hand. So when you look at the archeological record, um, as, as we do as archeologists, uh, we found a fairly striking pattern that there are a number of sites in central California, including our own backyard, that are chock full of these little tiny fish. Um, the first one, if we go from north to south, is up by Ani Nuevo, and it's called the Casa Grande site. And they're 25%, um, and not to throw out like some total like nerd words here, but the ichthyofaunal assemblage, which just means the, the fish bones that we find in archeological sites, 25% of, the, uh, of the, the fish bones there are, are pricklebacks. And it's the second ranked species. If we go down to the Big Sur River mouth, we see that 78% of the fish bones there are pricklebacks. It's the top ranked species. Um, the Piedras Blancas Lighthouse. And if you didn't know, like all these are surf spots for you guys that surf, right? Going from north to south, Anya Nuevo, Big Sur Rivermouth, the lighthouse. There, again, 25%. If we go down to Cambria, we also see out on the San Simeon Reef by the surf spot called Cardiacs that 45% of the fish bones there are, are also prickleback. So there's this strong signature in the archeological record where indigenous peoples were targeting these fish specifically um, and, and eating them, which, you know, made me bring up the question, like, why, you know, why? I mean, these little tiny fish. So when I was thinking about this, once I identified this pattern, the collection, the harvesting of this fish is probably associated with really low caloric return rates, right? It's a small fish. They live in a weird environment. You can't catch them with hook. You can't catch them with a net. So it probably took a lot of energy and time to catch these things. And you're not getting a lot of calories. So over the last about 25 years in archaeology, we have been really invested in this theoretical paradigm called human behavioral ecology. 
which really looks at how, how humans and the environment interact with one another. And it provides us some, some mechanisms to try to predict human behavior based on what we know about human activities, such as subsistence activities, as well as what we know about the, the types of prey that we harvest. And one of the tenets or the theories that are kind of under the umbrella of human behavioral ecology is called optimal foraging theory or OFT, right? Because as archaeologists, we love, we love acronyms. And optimal foraging theory suggests that through the evolutionary process, we've evolved even subconsciously to start to rank our subsistence activities and the types of prey that we target. So generally speaking, we look at the world or at least the food or the activities that we engage in to get food in this kind of economic cost benefit equation where we think that, you know, um, we want to try to get the most bang for our buck, which makes sense, right? So in this case, small prey that's hard to capture is usually considered to be really, really low ranking and human predators like all of us have evolved to want to target high rank species. And those are species that give us the most caloric return for the least amount of caloric expenditure. So in class, I usually like to address this scenario like this, like none of us, right? Cause we were all highly evolved humans. None of us would go hunting in the Santa Cruz mountains and hike 20 miles specifically to kill a squirrel, right? It makes zero sense. Why? It's not rhetorical. Why? Because they're everywhere. They're everywhere. But if you hike 20 miles and you kill an animal that's this big, Aww. you're going to starve. You're burning more calories than you're getting in return. So squirrel hunting would be a really low ranking. Well, squirrels in general would be really low ranking prey. And therefore, squirrel hunting would be a very low ranking subsistence activity. Right. In contrast, if we we're elk hunting, it might make sense to hike 15 or 20 miles in the Santa Cruz mountains if we're gonna kill an 800 pound animal because it provides a lot of a lot of calories um, in relationship to the amount of calories we're burning. So under this kind of theoretical paradigm, looking at the amount of pricklebacks we're seeing on the central coast and looking at it in the guise of optimal foraging theory, I asked the question, right? Why in the hell are people in central California targeting, catching, and eating pricklebacks because it doesn't make economic sense, right? From an optimal foraging perspective, initially, it doesn't make sense that humans were targeting these really small eel-like fish. So the question is why? So that's kind of our starting point. But before we get there, I just want to address some regional trends in some areas um, some geographical areas to the north and south of us to kind of put this in context, right? And show how the central coast is, is kind of special. So in Northern California, we really see the expansion of maritime adaptations, fishing and sea mammal hunting really, really kind of pop and increase about a thousand years before, you know, before now. Um, people were fishing and still using coastal resources before that. But a thousand years, things dramatically change. And if you're familiar with that area culturally, even now, you'll know that fishing is really important to indigenous folks, especially salmon. And we see that pattern really arise by about a thousand years, plus or minus years ago. And what we think it's because of the arrival of different cultural groups. Some other anthropologists have argued that's when the algic and the Athabascan speaking groups arrived in Northern California. And if you know the distribution of modern indigenous peoples in California, we're talking about groups like the Yurok, the Tolawa, the Hoopa, groups that are deeply invested in salmon fishing. So we see not only the expansion of, you know, this kind of overall maritime trend, but we also see that salmon uh, becomes really important, not just for subsistence, but culturally. And we see the development of, of really specialized salmon-based technology, nets, weirs, 
traps. We also see the development. And if you don't know this, groups in that area were just um, expert woodworkers. And they're making these cedar boxes. They were almost airtight. It's kind of like the, the modern day equivalent of, of Tupperware, where they had dry salmon out and they'd store them in these cedar boxes for, for up to a year. And all that is coming, coming to fruition about a thousand years before present. And but we what we don't think about is when we look at the, the fish bones and archaeological sites, what we find a lot of a, even more than salmon in many instances is small schooling fish like smelt, right? So a smelt is kind of part of this overall group of fish that we call silver sides. And that's a smelt in a human hand. That's a night smelt. So you can see that, right? Um, so these images, if you can see them, the image on the top is a photo from the 1950s of Tolawa people up by the Smith River at a fishing camp on the beach where they're harvesting smelt with dip nets from the surf and they're drying them out. And why I want to show this slide is to mention that I'm not just talking about the past, what native peoples used to do and talking about indigenous subsistence activities in past tense, because the Tolawa people and other groups up in you know, Northern California are still doing this as they've been doing for thousands of years. And the photo on the bottom part is a photo of a Tolawa fish camp from two years ago where native people still gather on the same beaches that their grandmothers and their great grandmothers and their great great grandmothers gathered and they're catching smelt in traditional ways and drying them on the beach. Not only because it's important food, but it's an important cultural tradition that brings people together and reifies their cultural identity. And this photo shows a hoopa a fisher person who built well, the community built this weir or this dam on the river that caused a natural break in the river where they could scoop up salmon. So we're talking about a lot of investment in technology to harvest um, salmon uh, effectively. So these are all trends that are going on uh, above the San Francisco Bay, um, all the way up to Southern Alaska. It's this widespread trend. Now, if we move to our Southern neighbors, we see in the Channel Islands and the Santa Barbara area, um, really early, and this isn't in the PowerPoint, but we find 14,000 year old archeological sites on the Channel Islands that show clear maritime adaptations. And in fact, largely what we know about the maritime hy um, migration hypothesis about indigenous peoples coming from the ocean and paddling down is supported largely by the archeology span on these islands. So from 14,000 years ago to 4,000 years ago, we see consistent maritime adaptations, but 4,000 years ago, things really change dramatically. And it's that time we start to see a dramatic increase in the evidence of, of fishing on, on the Santa Barbara Channel Islands. And it happens approximately when we start to see the development of, of shellfish hooks. So shellfish hooks appear in the archeological record about 4,000 years before present on the Channel Islands. They're earlier down South, but on the islands they appear about 4,000 years ago. And we can, quantify the increases in fishing by the amount of fish bones that we see in correlation with the arrival of these shellfish hooks. Um, if you really want to be bored to death, talk to me about this. This is what I did my master's thesis on, and I'll bore this shit out of everyone for like five hours about shellfish hooks. Um, but when we get to a thousand years before present, that's when we see the dramatic increase in fish and fish become a dietary staple where if we're talking about protein, animal protein, fish is number one on the Channel Islands and the adjacent Santa Barbara Channel mainland by about a thousand years ago. In that kind of late period, which in archaeology is about the last 800 years of time, we also see a dramatic increase in large pelagic fish. And throughout California, this is one of the only places that we see this. And in terms of large pelagic fish, I'm talking about tuna, large open water sharks, and specifically swordfish 
And I'll come back to swordfish shortly. And during that time period, we also see the increase of fishing technology, including the tamol. And I'll explain that in the next slide because there's an image of the tamol. It's a big boat. Uh, harpoons, lures, nets, and a variety of other intensive technologies designed to supply a surplus of fish for a very complex group of indigenous peoples living on the island and the adjacent mainland. So that image in your upper left, if you can see it where you are, is an artist's um, version of a tamol. A tamol is, or they are one of the most sophisticated watercraft ever developed on the west coast of the Americas by indigenous peoples. Most watercraft that was made in North America was based on a dugout style boat. A dugout is when you take a single trunk of a tree, scoop out the middle and shape it like a boat, but you're limited in the dimensions of the boat by the size of the trunk of the tree. The tamol is completely different. The tamol is made out of redwood planks. So the Chumash people and their ancestors would find redwood drift logs on the beach because there's no redwood trees in Santa Barbara. And using only stone and bone tools, they'd split them and shape them into perfectly shaped planks like we would get from the hardware store. No metal, no nails, no saws, no Mr. Gertler to help you out in wood shop, right? You're just, this is all based on stone tools. And they'd shape these planks in the shape of a boat. And then they would take the edges of the boat and they'd drill small holes in the margins and they'd sew them together and they would caulk the margins with asphaltum. And if you've ever been to Santa Barbara and walked on the beach or surfed there, you'll know that you get a lot of tar on your feet. Now, when I was young, I thought that was seepage from the offshore oil wells. It's not. It's natural seepage from petroleum products seeping out of the seafloor and then accumulating on the beach. And the Chumash people would take that, oftentimes mixing it with charcoal and pine pitch, and they'd make a glue out of it, and they'd use it to caulk the seams of their boat. And that way, they weren't limited to the size of the log. They could build these incredibly seaworthy ships with freeboard and freeboard's a measurement of the distance between the waterline and the top of the gunnel or the rail of the boat so intuitively the taller right the more freeboard you have the more seaworthy the ship is going to be now coming back to the swordfish you not might not be able to see it but this image here if you look really closely especially if you're up front this is a piece of rock art this is a, a a pictograph from a cave in Santa Barbara County depicting a swordfish. We find swordfish bones in the archeological record and we know ethnographically the swordfish was a really important ceremonial or religious figure in Chumash mythology. And in fact, modern Chumash ceremonies like pictured in the upper right is a swordfish dancer. And the swordfish was this big bodied fish that supplied a lot of food. But in Chumash mythology, the swordfish were actually relatives to humans that lived underwater. They lived in villages, they had tribes, they had chiefs, just like onland Chumash people. But the onland Chumash people would have a shaman, a, a leader that would dress up like a swordfish and perform ceremonies to venerate the swordfish because it was the swordfish that was responsible for driving whales up on the beach. And what's a whale? It's this giant package of calories and fat, and it was a huge, huge resource. And when a whale would wash up on the beach, the Chumash thought it's because their ancestors or their relatives, the swordfish, were driving them up on land. So in terms of at least the last thousand years, the Chumash people in Southern California were a deeply maritime invested group of people. Their ideology, their religion was focused on the ocean. Um, their subsistence was focused on the ocean. Now we get to Central California, right? Where we live. Archeologists in contrast to the North and South have identified very little change in terms of fish exploitation 
throughout time. We do note a little bit of an increase in fishing in a time period about a thousand years ago that we collectively refer to as the medieval climatic anomaly. And it's a period of extreme environmental change. There is massive droughts and famine on land and people probably couldn't you know, um, rely on terrestrial resources. So therefore in central California, people started to rely on these oceanic resources more and more. Um, in the late period, in the last thousand years ago, after the medieval climatic anomaly was over, there's a decrease in fishing, in the at least observable in the archaeological record in most places. Um, in contrast to the south and Santa Barbara Channel, there's probably a lack of the tamol. People were probably building tule rafts, maybe had dugouts, but we don't see a lot of evidence of tamols north of Point Conception. And fishing in Central California is heavily dependent on the types of environments. So sites that we find near the rocky intercoastal areas are full of rockfish and cabazon. And I know some of you catch those things, right? We know that they inhabit the rocky reef environments. And sites that we find adjacent to sandy beaches, they're full of surf perch, which is a common species on sandy beaches. And then the sites that are around estuaries are full of bat rays and also small schooling fish that people likely um, exploited with nets. But there is one pattern starting about a 5,000 years ago, we start to see an increased exploitation of our ugly little eel-like fish, the prickleback, which kind of brings us back to the question, why? Why were people doing this? So to try to address this question, um, over the last couple of years, I've engaged in some intertidal foraging experiments, and I've done some experimental archaeology. Um, Specifically, the experiments that we have done have been designed to try to cal um, calculate the caloric return rate of this type of fishing practice. And to do this, we go out and we try to catch these things by hand in modern times. And we record the search time it takes. So you're walking around looking in the right habitat. If you find like a big rock that you can lift up, you lift the rock up. And then if you see something, your search time is done. And then you move into pursuit, right? So the pursuit, I want you to keep that in your back pocket because when you're catching these little things, they're like Harry Houdini. And I know some of you can attest to this. And just asking Leo and Andy, uh, in terms of the fish that you saw, how many do you think you caught? Well, zero, zero right? Zero. These things are like Harry Houdini's. And Grace, you can test this. You could saw a ton of these things. You can hold them, but these things are amazing. They're, they're small, they're tiny, and they move like lightning. And they're perfectly camouflaged. And they're in your hand, and they can slip through your fingers. And as soon as they hit the water poof, they're gone and you won't find them again. So largely the biggest cost in terms of time and energy is not just like, you know, once you find them, it's actually catching them. And then we also have to think about processing costs, which archeologists use all these things to calculate overall return rates of any type of hunting or fishing types of activity, right? Um, and all of this in archaeology, especially experimental archaeology, which is designed around replicating artifacts and simulating past behavior, all of this is kind of under an umbrella that we call middle range research. And middle range research in archaeology is really important to understand because what we do in archaeology is we go out and we dig holes and we find stuff that's been in the ground for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And these things are static and they're in the dirt. But what do they represent? They represent very complex human behaviors, incredibly complex. Going fishing just isn't about fishing. It's about seasonality. It's about gender. It's about age, right? So all these things come into factor. So middle range research is a bridge, right? Between what we find in the dirt and the complex human behaviors in the past 
that created these things. And that's what we try to do by replicating and simulating these kind of past foraging strategies. So in this one, what did we do? We went up the coast. We went up to Southern San Mateo County. Um, we did some foraging experiments around um, Pigeon Point Lighthouse. In the past, I worked um, in Northern Santa Bar in Northern Santa Cruz County on a similar type of activity. And a group of very dedicated students, many of them that are in this room, helped me out. Um, so Cabrillo College anthropology students, members of our local anthropology club, they donated their time and we drove up the coast last Thursday or Friday? Thursday, thank you. And on a low tide, we went out to the intertidal zone and we tried to catch these things. So we measured the amount of time. We would catch fish, put them in a bucket, measure the weight of the fish, all in hopes to try and to calculate the, the overall return rates of this type of strategy. So are you ready for the results? All right. What's the recipe? <laughs> you'll get that. In the last slide, you'll see it, Darren. I'll, I'll show you the recipe, right? Um, the results. And I know this font is really, really small, and I apologize, but I've done two kind of uh, – experiments, one by myself and one with the Cabrillo College students. So this kind of data set is a combination of both of those. So in two foraging experiments, over the course of three days, we ended up catching 25 of these small little eel-like fish. And they were huge, ranging from five centimeters to about 18 centimeters, right? And weighing from six grams to 40 grams. So these are small little things, right? Um, we also caught one northern clingfish, which is pretty cool. If you've never seen those, it looks like a tadpole on steroids and its mouth's on the bottom and they cling onto rocks. So again, the font's small, but the caloric return rate for this type of foraging out of all these experiments ranges from 23 to 99 calories per foraging hour. How many people know in this room, and bolt it out if you know, how many calories does a semi-active adult person need per day? 2,000. Pardon? 2,000. 2, so think about that. If we're topping out at 99 calories per hour, how many hours a day would you have to forage to eat, to feed yourself? About 20 hours, right? 20 hours a day to feed yourself. This sucks, right? <laughs> I mean, this is a really low rank types type of activity. Um, just to put this in perspective, earlier experiments I did, when you have shell fish hooks and you're out in the kelp beds, you're usually averaging about 200 calories per hour. Plucking mussels off the rocks, you're about four to 400 to 500 calories per hour. Abalone, if we still had an abalone season, hopefully it, it might open back up in our lifetime. Uh, 1,500 to 2,000 calories per foraging hour. Acorn for harvesting, 13,000 to 1,500 calories per hour. Pine nuts, about the same, especially if you're in the Eastern Sierra, 1,300 to 1,500. And if you're lucky enough to be in an estuary environment where there's large schools of anchovies coming in, we've shown that you can uh, gather... 15 to 20,000 calories per hour per forager. So to just to think about that, right? Prickleback is way down on the list. And if we're thinking about this from an optimal foraging perspective, it should be considered super low ranking. Aaliyah. Sure. So I probably have about six hours solo and two hours with the group. Yeah. And in terms of those two hours, it was two 30 minute sessions. So, so that's a good question. So please think about this. Th these are very proxy measures, right? I'm not talking absolutes here. We're talking about proxy measures of things that were happening thousands of years ago in some instances. So, which brings us back to the question, if you can read that. Why in the hell are people eating these things, right? Why are they spending so much time to catch and eat these tiny little creatures? One of the explanations could be a lack of higher ranking taxa. Deer, sea mammals, larger fish, larger sea mammals that would give you more bang for your buck. 
Why could there be a lack of these bigger critters? It could be environmental change. We know environmental change isn't something that's just happening now. The environment has changed throughout the entire Holocene period when people were occupying California. So there could be some environmental issues that are taking place here. Or those higher ranking resources, since they are higher ranking, should be targeted first by human predators. And therefore, there's a chance that those high ranking species are just being overexploited by human beings. And therefore, people are turning to lower ranking resources. But in the archaeological record, there's not a lot of evidence for that, at least in central California. Another and possibly better explanation is all about environmental circumscription, territorial circumscription. And that's due to increased populations and a reduction of foraging territory. So some support for this idea and to kind of give you kind of a better idea of what this means, um, in California archaeology, that period around 5,500 years ago marks a really important turning point in terms of what we see archaeologically. At that point, overall, we see, at least in Central California, an increase in archaeological sites. That's also when we see a transition and uh, some archaeologists believe um, increased emphasis on acorns. And if you remember fourth grade from California or fourth grade and doing, you know, California classes, you'll know that all California natives subsisted on, on acorns. Well, it's really, you know, some people did. And really, it's they're only turning to that about 5,000, you know, years before present. At least that's what we think archaeologically. So we see the development of this acorn economy. We see more and more sites. So the idea here is that prior to 5,000 years ago, populations were lower. So if somebody was living in, say, a specific river valley or on a creek or on a specific beach, if resources became scarce, what'd you do? You got up and you moved, right? You solved the resource shortages through mobility. You would just get up and go somewhere else where there's better resources. But by 5,000 years before present, it looks like the coast of California is so full of people, you can't just get up and go, right? Because if you get up and go to another creek, somebody's there. And there's going to be conflict. There's going to be issues. So you have to hunker down and make best with what you got around there. Um, and thankfully, I have friends that are a lot smarter than me that have researched this kind of stuff. And A.D. Whitaker and Brian Bird of Far Western have come up with similar interpretations to try to explain um, the exploitation of these little guys in Southern California. It's called the bean clam. It's a donax. That's what they, you know, the genus is a donax. And they call, they're called a bean clam because they're about the size of a pinto bean, right? And they are also associated with super low return rates. And what Whitaker and Bird suggested is people in Southern California started to eat those things because of environmental circumscription. Because before they just walk around and find bigger stuff, but as more and more people were living on the coast, they had to hunker down and to exploit much smaller things. So some other interpretations. Um, just to think about this, optimal foraging theory, which has been really guiding California archaeology and the study of hunting and gathering groups for the last 25 years, the way they interpret the past is really based on an adult male hunter. Hopefully you can see already some problems with that, right? In terms of if we're talking about entire cultural groups, it's not all adult male hunters. So Dr. Christy Boone, who went to, got her dissertation from UC Santa Cruz, introduced me to this concept of dynamic state variable modeling, which instead of just optimal foraging theory, which looks at the caloric expenditures and benefits from a male hunter, looks at a wider range of demographics, such as, women in the past, moms that were provisioning children, children themselves, the elderly, people that were restricted through mobility. And what we find is different people in different parts of their life and in different seasons need different resources and focus on different resources. 
So one of the things that we're maybe looking at here in terms of targeting pricklebacks is women provisioning offspring. Women that might not have the ability to take their four and five-year-old hiking to go kill deer or elk or paddle out on a boat in the middle of the storm, but they need a consistent source of food and they want to avoid or reduce risk. And there's two risks that you need to consider. One, the risk of failure, right? Because if you're an adult guy that's not worried about provisioning your kids, you can go a couple of days without eating, right? It's not that big of a deal. But what if you have little ones at home, right? I know some of you do, right? Could you imagine just coming home and be like, sorry, kids, not eating today. It'd be really problematic. So, and you're also reducing the risk of dying trying to find food. So this is one strategy that might have been really, really appealing to this demographic of women provisioning offspring. And that's supported by data as well. There are these two researchers, Doug and Rebecca Bird, that have spent time living with and working with modern hunters and gatherers in the Pacific, as well as in the center of Australia. And what they find there is that all these things are kind of supported, that people are actually doing this. And I'll come back to that in a second. The other thing we need to think about are kids themselves. And this is no offense to anybody with kids or anybody that has been a kid, but kids in modern Western society are worthless. <laughs> no offense to you guys. They're cute. We love them, but they don't really provide that much. They are resource sucks. They're in your fridge. They probably come home from college or, you know, living in San Diego and eat all your food, do laundry, but they don't really give anything in return. Doug and Rebecca Bird, while working with modern hunting and gathering folks, have found out that children in these societies provide a lot, right? They can go out and they can catch critters and feed the family. And in fact, these Martu children from Central Australia go out and they catch small lizards and rodents and insects. And sometimes they can provide up to 6,000 calories per day. And if you're six years old and you only need 800 calories, you're providing a surplus to your family that's helping your parents and helping feed your, you know, your, your siblings. Um, so these kids are targeting low ranked resources like lizards because they have little legs, right? These, not the lizards, the kids. So, so adults in these situations are out hunting red kangaroo and these giant birds and these sand iguanas but they're walking like 10 or 15 miles a day. They need bows and arrows. They need a lot of technology and they need mobility. Kids can't do that. So just like many of you in this room, they're hanging out around their houses, catching lizards, probably like a lot of you caught blue belly lizards when you were kids, but instead of letting them go, they're taking them home and they're eating them, right? And their family's eating them. Um, so we see children maybe playing a role in this idea. And we also see that there's little or no technological investment needed to grab fish out of tide pools. And it might've been also appealing to people with reduced mobility. So other, other interpretations, pricklebacks don't live alone. When we were going out trying to catch these things, as many of you as can, can contest, every time you lift up a rock in the intertidal zone, even if you don't see a prickleback, what do you see? Sand? Yeah, you see a lot of sand, but sand's not very yummy. But you see crabs, you finding these little turban snails, and you find octopus. Like our friend Leo here is about to take a bite, out, right? He does. True story. So early on when I started to do this type of research, I was targeting prickleback. And on my second research kind of trip to do intertidal foraging, I started to practice this, this procedure that I, I've termed intertidal vacuuming. So you lift up a rock and instead of just looking for prick, prickleback, you grab what's ever there, what, what's ever edible. These little turban snails, crabs, octopods, and you throw them in the bucket. And what I found is if you do that, if you invest in intertidal foraging, your return rates from pricklebacks doesn't go down at all, but your investment, your return rates overall go up threefold. So instead of getting 99 calories, per foraging hour, you're getting up to 300 calories per foraging hour by grabbing all these little things. And we see it archeologically. 
We see it archaeologically because every site that we find a large percentage of pricklebacks, we also find a shit ton of crabs and turban snails. Unfortunately, we haven't found a way to find octopods in the archaeological record because most of them decompose, right? Um, and it also supports interpretations and environmental circumscription as well. Um, so to wrap this up, Pricklebacks and intertidal vacuuming may be evidence of circumscription related to growing populations in California and indigenous Californians needing to switch their subsistence activities based on these overall population trends. Uh, possible evidence of diverse demographics. So in archaeology, it's rare that we can address different demographics, but this might be an opportunity for us to think about women in the past, women provisioning children in the past, children in the past and other demographics with limited mobility. Um, and we see ramifications outside of Central California. Um, I just read an article to prepare for this, and there are sites in Northern California that are full of pricklebacks. These are right at the mouths of rivers that should have been full of salmon and steelhead, and yet people are targeting pricklebacks. The answer is why? If the river is full of salmon, we know these people targeted salmon, why in the hell are they focused on these small little fish? And then we have seasonality issues, right? Um, if you know the tides in Central California, we get these large low tides in the wintertime, right? Um, it's also a time period where terrestrial resources are fairly scarce. There's not a lot of plant food in winter and early spring in Central California. Game animals, if you're a hunter, become really lean, so there's not a lot of fat. So maybe there's a, a seasonality component to this as well. Just kind of thinking about, you know, ideas in the past. So, so anyway, and um, I just want to say thanks to all my students at Cabrillo, whether you participate in this project or not, I love you guys. You're the reason that I'm here. And if you participate in this, thank you for your time and following a jackass like me up the coast of California to go pull tiny little fish out of the tide pools. Um, my son Briggs, he was our juvenile forager on this project. And even though he didn't get any pricklebacks, he put a lot of crabs and tegulous snails and octopus in the bucket. So you can see firsthand that even kids can contribute in this type of scenario. And thanks to all the smart people that wrote articles that helped me out here. Um, and to go back to you, Mr. Gertler, um, here's the recipe. And this is the cool part about doing experimental archaeology is you can come home with, with dinner, including a plate of delicious tegula, some prickleback octopus, as well as a rock crab. And the important part, the butter and garlic and the Pacifico. Wow, magnifique. Thanks, my friends. So... I know we're we're at eight thirty. We're technically done. I didn't leave enough time for questions. Are are there are there questions or comments? We have plenty of time. Yeah. Uncle Uncle Bill, right? Yeah. Yeah. So some of the, like catching a lot of the, the pickleback. It seems to me like maybe the catch methods were different than the slipping with the rock, right? Maybe they had like a dip that they could do. Go through and quickly gather them. It brings to mind, you know, reading the issue and they talk about how he was spinning butt with obsidian. Yeah, absolutely. Just in lightning speed. Yes. So like their their corralic or caloric uh intake was easier matched by their skill levels. What one hundred percent. So yeah. Um could you kind of summarize this question and the people on Zoom won't be able to hear the Oh shit, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> sorry, Zoom World. Um Great question. So the question was talking about kind of the, the techniques that were going on in the past versus what we're doing today. You're absolutely right. All this experimental archaeology, this is a proxy measure, right? This is one way to address the problem. Were these people better at this? 100%. Was the environment different? Absolutely. Did they have some sort of net? Maybe. But for those of you guys that have done this, it'd be really hard um, when you are targeting these things to drag a net because there's there's rocks, there's algae, there's other things going on. So I don't know in this specific case if a net would would really help out that much, potentially. But this is kind of a, a are these things exact? Absolutely not. This is like 
a bunch of dumb modern people, you know, trying to hang out and figure out what was going on a thousand years before present the best way we can. But you're right. They probably had, and you have to think also, I mean, these are people that their dads did it, their moms did it, their grandmas, their great grandmas, their, you know, so there's institutional knowledge that's being passed down through family members. So they're absolutely better at it. So this is kind of like a, a little glimpse of things that might've happened, but it's the best we can do, right? It's the best we can do, but great question. Uh, Mrs. Edwards. <laughs> Are you talking about finding them on, on the site along the coast or in at living sites somewhere else? So the sites that we have documented large quantities of pricklebacks are our coastal sites. Um, I don't know, but that's a good question. I mean, all this is very preliminary. I haven't found any sites where pricklebacks have been a substantial part of the faunal assemblage, you know, more than you know, five or 10 kilometers inland. That seems, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And there's foods that are eaten on site, but then the remains are disposed of differently. Like one of the things we deal with up in the Pacific Northwest is we know people ethnographically and historically ate a lot of salmon, but we find sites where there's not a lot of salmon bones. But we also know ethnographically that groups of people in the Pacific Northwest, after eating salmon, they would return the bones to the river out of respect for the salmon and in hopes that that salmon would return the next season up upstream. So there's this differential deposition that might be, you know, making this problem more complex. The part you mentioned there about children, one of the things we saw in Micronesia where a lot of the fishing yeah. is in the lagoons in the ocean, where the kids were the ones who were going from being on shore. Yes. Being a big chunk of the diet for everybody. Yes, absolutely. Kids in those societies play such an important role that I think those of us that have a modern Western mindset that haven't traveled just don't realize that kids are such an active part of these subsistence economies and are generating food. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Vincent. Do you think there's an argument to be made like this, like the move from calor caloric necessity that is just objectively like a fun activity to do. And that's why it's so prevalent too. And then also like the community building aspect of it too. No, we can't measure that scientifically. So it didn't happen. It didn't, it didn't happen. I don't want to hear about it. No, you're absolutely right. Right. I, we're, we're so limited archaeologically to understand what was going on in the past. I mean, what does a pile of bones? I mean, mean, I mean, maybe these things, another thing to look at, maybe they're just yummy. Right. Maybe they're targeting them because people people liked them. Right. I have. I mean, that's yeah, they're delicious. And in fact, they're larger cousins. For those of you guys, if you're bored this winter and want to do something really cool, uh, go poke polling. So in low tides, like those minus tides in the winter, you can take a long stick, put a little hook at the end with a piece of squid and poke it down in the rocks and catch the, their bigger cousins that are this big. And for me, they make the best fish tacos. Better than rockfish, better than lingcod, better than anything you eat. Monkey face eel makes great tacos. They're delicious. These things are delicious. And the little ones, right? We're talking about processing as terms of like one of the costs that we think about. Dude, when they're this big, I mean, I didn't even gut that one. You know, I just threw it, threw it freaking in a frying pan and then just ate it, you know? And so zero processing costs, you know, it's delicious. So yeah, um, was it fun? Absolutely. Was it community building? Absolutely. Maybe was it a way that parents are like, you need to get out of camp right now or I'm going to choke you because you've been annoying me. So you need to go down on the tide pools and their kids just playing. I mean, I know none of, the other parents in here have ever done that, right? You've never gotten you've never gotten annoyed with the kids and it's like kicked them out of the house and said, go do something. So there's all these factors we just can't control, right? Uh, so potentially, I don't know. Yeah, it's a great question. Andy, you had your hand up. Oh, my question already got here. Okay. I was just saying like specifically 
with the use of nets, it seems like it might have been useful in kind of like like a really small handheld net, kind of like an aquarium. Yeah. Where like in a very limited sense, they could be used to stop them from houdiniing themselves. Yeah. That would just be difficult to answer archaeologically because that would create some damage. Right? Yeah, it's hard. And I've never seen a net, not saying they didn't exist, but I've never seen a net in Calyx is the, the preservation. I mean, organic material just doesn't preserve in the archaeological record. And most nets are made out of like organic cordage. But I've never seen a net recovered in California with an aperture. The opening of the net small enough to, to capture, you know, those, those tiny five centimeter, six centimeter long pricklebacks. And if they can squeeze, what was that? Well, this is a pair so fast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, they, they squeeze through the openings of your fingers, right? So so I don't know. I mean, maybe they did exist. I've just never seen them. Yeah. Is there no, that's one thing we can definitely identify. So sea urchins do leave a tangible, you know, sign in the archaeological record. We find spines and the you know the broken shells and it's it's they're they're really diagnostic when you see them you know as a person that you know john can attest to this and dustin you know if you do a lot of you know min analysis you can pick out sea urchins they break up in these little small like little fragments and i'm not trying to be crass but they have these little nipples on them right they have these little nipples on the shell where the spines attach you've seen them pat right so you can find sea urchins sea urchins were, were eaten so could you imagine like we're going to sushi restaurants and paying like forty dollars for uni, and they're just like, uni. It's, it's what's for breakfast? Questions, comments? Hmm? Oh, thanks, Julie, and thanks for being here. And if if you don't know, Julie has been been part of the society, and the only reason I have a job at Cabrillo is because her husband paid paved the way for me. So, big kudos. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Any um, questions on Zoom, though? No? Why is Dusty so dumb? <laughs> well, we'll be here for another two hours to explain that one. The, the comment was that geophytes and blue dicks are not going to use fish. Blue dicks, it's, it's, a, it's a bulb. It's a little plant, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, they're 4,000 like, yeah, yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks you guys for putting up with me. I, I appreciate you guys being here on a on a Thursday night when you could out be doing other fun stuff. So thanks for your time. And if you haven't, if you're interested in archaeology, if you're not part of the society, definitely recommend becoming a member of the Santa Cruz Archaeological Society. Um, yeah. Great folks, great people, great events. So thanks, you guys. Really appreciate you. We have a couple yeah. quick announcements, Carlin. Yeah, first of all, on your way out, please relieve us of these cookies. Yes. Yes, that is there. That's how you do it. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to leave this over on the table for you. And then I just want to, uh, as I indicated, that uh, Canary Burbank um, is going to be our uh, secretary. For continuing the secretary for another two years. So, yay, Mary. If you join this society, the newsletter is filled with really interesting stories about our family. Yeah, and it's really very wonderful. We have quite a few samples, and they're free for you to take. Please do so. Um, there's a lot of effort that goes into some of the uh, articles that various people provide, students included, provide stories. Sometimes, just saying. <laughs> hey, Dusty would give me extra credit. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. No way. I'm yeah. <laughs> anyway. So Why don't I try to think about it? Oh, yeah. Also, yeah, we also have some books that have been donated from a couple of sources that are, um, they're free for a donation of your choice. Um, there's also, um, yeah, let me grab one as an example. So Sim Schneider 
professor up at the university, as many of you may know, designed this for us. It's our new sticker. Um, it says uh, Santa Cruz Archaeological Society has a drawing that we did of a um, of a hook, as a matter of fact, and it says curve sharpens. And he was inspired by the fish hook driving situation here down in uh, as you head out of town onto Highway 17 or or one. Um, Anyway, these are currently, uh, they were donated to us and we are selling them for $2 each. And uh, next month, um, I believe the date is November 14th. It's the second Thursday of November. We will have um, Dr. Lightfoot, Professor Emeritus from UC Berkeley. And he will be talking, um, his um, talk is entitled Recent Collaborative Eco-Archaeological Investigations on the Central California Coast, Findings and Outcomes. And I think they did a project up Northern Santa Cruz County, Southern San Mateo County. And so he is going to uh, speak next month. And that talk will be taking place over in the other room, which is that way. It's the Scott uh, Kennedy Hall, and uh, it's a much larger uh, venue. So, so please come and join us so next month. <laughs> and thank you for coming tonight. So we have a friend who's not uh, and don't forget to take a cookie. <laughs> uh, if uh, you want to grab a chair, we wouldn't shoot you from I'm <laughs> 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 